chapter four of the, the textbook, um, Semantics for Enterprise Data. Um, one high level summary point of the whole presentation is I don't think there's a lot of um, new details here that we haven't covered. I think this is really more of like a specific um, application or classification to how we might be using everything we've already been talking about in the class up to this point. Um, so one thing we've already covered um, and that we know at this point is that semantics are good for dealing with heterogeneity and uh, large scale and dynamic content, which are um, key problems that industries and so it, enterprise data refers to like corporations and businesses, obviously. Um, so they have to deal with um, all of these problems as well. Um, specifically like Fortune 500s and things. Imagine large, large scale companies. Um, they have um, similar problems that we've talked about in the past with heterogeneity where um, businesses often tend to have, um, I, I don't know, perhaps this is just my opinion, but they seem to have more problems with, uh, with locked data and locked content and hidden in files and repositories and SharePoint sites and um, they try to put things out on their websites, but sometimes they just make files accessible. Um, they might have different databases. Um, I know like um, different organizations in companies might, um, they might install various programs and applications to help them do their job, their business specifically, like to help them perform better. But then you have lots of different disparate data sources all over a company that don't communicate, there's no way to talk to them. Um, so a lot of similar problems we've talked about with heterogeneity. Um, companies often have websites that talk about their business, their products, their organizations, um, their organization, organizational uh, structures. Um, so things that are public facing, not just private data, like um, uh, you know, so their sales numbers and things that they might have perhaps internally. Um, they would also have multimodal content. There might be imagery, um, both internal, external. They might have images internal that de define um, training for various business processes that they that they have. Um, also, videos and things like training videos. There could be external and internal data that they have to to um, to deal with and manage. Um, so some basic requirements, so obviously leveraging semantics in an enterprise, there's some basic requirements for, for, um, for dealing with that. Um, uh, listed here, basically extract and organize and standardize. So um, how do you extract the data that's, that's in those um, files and organize it semantically so you know, different organizations within a business can communicate to one another effectively. Um, and standardizing the, the, the meanings and the semantics. Um, leveraging heterogeneous sources, we talked about that. Um, semantically discovering relationships, so obviously they would want to not only, so that'd be, that'd be a benefit that they'd want to get from, from all of the, um, um, you know, so once they extract all this data and create ontologies to perhaps define um, ways for organizations to communicate. How do they then extract that different organizations have impacts on other organizations within the company? Um, there's an emphasis on auto automation that's talked about where um, the ability to author the content, extract the content, and share the content needs to be highly automated or else no enterprise will ever spend the time to um, hire somebody to just sit here and do this all manually. Um, and this, and that goes to the second point, well, as well, tools to to translate discovery into actionable intelligence to be able to search and find it and leverage it is are all critical requirements for an enterprise to make use of semantics. Um, there's discussion about a need for an enterprise architecture where the entire enterprise defines everything within their corporation, all their business processes. Um, so. There's, uh, there's roles, there's who is it, how is it managed, so that would go to organizational structures, um, processes that groups follow, and you know, who does what facet of what part of the business within the organization, um, you know, who produces what data, what data is produced, what goes out to the customer, everything that the, that the, the 
business um, performs, everything that it does um, is supposed to be documented and defined in, with a semantic meaning under an enterprise architecture. Um, one of the key benefits is agility within the enterprise. So a lot of companies reorg all the time. They're, they're, you know, somebody's now a manager, somebody else, they take two organizations, pull them together, split them apart, move around. So all of a sudden, somebody's process for a team is now split apart into two different processes managed by different managers, reporting to a different vice president, all that kind of craziness that's constantly moving. So um, being able to define what the business is doing with the semantics allows them to easily adapt and, and move, um, move that around without um, maybe having as bad of a cost of trying to figure out manually, you know, who's doing what now and, and who reports to whom and you know, who's producing that data. Um, mergers and acquisitions is listed here. That's another thing. So reorgs internal mergers or you know, some big Fortune 500 company like Google or somebody buys somebody else. Um, if there is an enterprise architecture that defines the entire the entirety of the business and who does what with you know with whom, um, they can then semantically correlate those various things into their existing enterprise architecture and help um, help. Um, I guess be able to leverage that knowledge quicker and faster. Oh, um, distributed locations, processes. Um, so I guess that's where, that's what the enterprise architecture is, is supposed to help define all those processes because even within the same organization or with mergers and acquisitions, you know, the, everybody might have a different way of handling billing or um, tracking um, bid proposals for, for grants or whatever. So there might be very simil similar concepts happening in different organizations, but um, they might have um, unique variances in how they, how they work and handle it. Um, key barriers. Um, format heterogeneity refers to the format of the data. It might be in some database because somebody downloaded some tool that was on the internet and that helped them um, do their work better and get things done, but now you have data in some obscure format. Um, content nature refers more to, you know, what is it that you're you're storing? You know, is this some kind of um, marketing document and it's got public facing information, or is it something internal? Is it some memo? Um, so there's a obviously a variety of data to be dealt with there, and then of course trying to actually derive something actionable from it, some sort of um, something that will help the, um, the corporation achieve some goal, perhaps some business analytics or, or something to that, to that nature. There has to be some kind of business benefit from it. Um, semantics assists in all of these problems with a lot of stuff that we've really talked about up to this point in the class already, semantic organization and metadata, it's annotating the data and providing organization of different, you know, similar concepts um, between all of the various pieces of, of data. Um, normalization would be things like semantic ambiguity where um, perhaps a company has a, a word for a process, but somebody else in the company uses the same word for a different process, things like that. Um, semantic search, <coughs> being able in, say, a, a company to, to um, search across all of those um, pieces of, you know, all those silos of data is, is critical for somebody to find the actionable app intelligence. And semantic association would refer to um, Maybe there's different ontologies, different meanings of things scattered about the company, or you know, when there's a merger and somebody else has a different ontology for their business, trying to um, associate those meanings together, obviously not manually, but programmatically would be ideal. Um, one key problem is implicit semantics, obviously. People writing up um, a you know, proposal, bid and proposal kind of thing for a grant or a contract or somebody writing marketing material, 
They're not annotating it. They're just writing up a Word document or a PDF and putting it out there. Um, so all the meanings in the, the language. And the challenge is how do you infer that? Um, there's various metadata extraction techniques using dictionaries that might, um, you know, contain taxonomies of, of information to help, uh, you know, kind of like keyword type of extractions. Um, entity and relationship recognition. So not, obviously you want to detect entities in, in all of these documents, but then how do you relate to the fact that that, okay, you found this data 75 times in a document set. Does that imply a relationship? Um, using ontology, so if you already have an ontology defined, you can use that for extracting information, of course. Um, and then, of course, there's technical domain-specific type of things for um, if you have um, scientific-related you know, data fields, um, values that have ranges on them, rules, um, business processes, that kind of stuff all would feed into automatic extraction. A lot of the stuff we've talked about, obviously, in the past, like ontologies, um, there was a slide in one of the previous um, talks where he showed some, I don't remember if it was like a web page or something, and it was marked up, it had Microsoft and uh, um, major companies and CEOs and financial information. So that's that's what this is referring to. It's how to how to pull out that extraction off of those documents. So how is the technically domain metadata different from the ontology? There may or may not be ontology defined, but that's actually a good question. Um, that's a, that's actually a really good question. May, maybe somebody has technical rules or processes for their business that they define, but it's not in an ontology. So, um, I guess that perhaps you could just say you would have to, if, if you were implementing some kind of extraction capability, you might have to code something to the business process. Now, that one option might be trying to create an ontology to define the process, um, but maybe that doesn't exist. Sure. So I guess those are just apparently various techniques that could be used. So I'm not really sure that that has a specific um, application other than just having to apply processes or, or things. Yeah, so like ranges and things, um, those are going to apply, but these are obviously in ontologies. So uh, there seems to there be some overlap there. But I'm not sure what four is by itself. And then, then there's a whole section of the chapter that goes into great detail about this, which we've seen all before. Um, the score system is, has metadata extraction and um, deals with structured and semi-structured data. And so it talks about basically um, how would an enterprise set up a system by which they could solve all of these problems. And um, the thing that we've been talking about all quarter here is uh, all semester is is relevant to setting up a system architecture for such such a thing. One other thing that got mentioned that's related to content processing is Open Refine, which is referred to as Google Refine in the book. Um, it, Google deprecated the project; it went open source. Um, it says it deals; it's a tool for cleaning and transforming data and linking it to databases. It's basically like um, it's like a spreadsheet Excel type of tool. You can load in data. It'll do a bunch of analysis on columns for you. It'll, um, it's got tons of little tools built in to show you, um, to basically kind of sh visualize and show you meaning. That then you can say, oh, I, I see that they've detected a pattern. I want to filter this out. You can correlate data. Um, this was mentioned as useful because um, if you think about um, like corporate data repositories, people aren't very good at being consistent. And so people might type things in, make typos, and um, there might be 10 different ways of referring to the same exact process. And so when you're trying to parse data, um, 
this will this is just a tool that at least help you visualize some of those some of those kinds of trends in the data. Um, it also automatically links to Freebase, probably because it was developed by Google. Um, it has a feature where you can basically say, I want this column to map to a certain feature that you can find in Freebase, and you can sit there and um, but actually, I think it'll auto detect and give you some suggestions. You can also pick one, customize it. Um, this little thing just shows you where somebody had some data with names of films. And it's kind of hard to read from there. Um, and they, and they said correlate this with the Freebase um, entity, and it auto detected and and then gave things where you're like Terminator was ambiguous. It gives you some little things so you can pick and so. It's all manual. It's not. Uh, it's obviously not going to help anybody in a big enterprise scale, but it is. It is kind of handy. It's a useful processing tool, at least. Um, linked enterprise data is just a coined term for everything we're talking about here. It is linked data. It's just not open, obviously. Um, there's a short discussion about. Um, one of the goals for linked enterprise data is to make it both machine readable and human readable. Um, I did not explore that topic, but that actually um, is an interesting question in my brain that I should go explore a little more, because that would be interesting how you would blend machine and human readable content all together. Um, uh, there's a concept of a linked data enterprise. The enterprise being um, is a business a linked to data enterprise or not? And that's defined by um, coupling the information creation with sharing. And the way to share it would be by adding in all of the um, um, semantic meaning so that other people can, can, under, can understand it. Um, and so that says that the authoring the content should include both. So um, there's a goal basically to be able to automatically create both content and meaning at the same time seamlessly. And if you could produce a tool, you know, somehow augment a you know, Microsoft Word or something, so they can be adding in meaning, meaning into the data while um, creating the data, that's the ultimate goal here. Um, so th I guess that is what defines a link to data enterprise. E-science is a case study that's talked about for a bit of the chapter there. Um, they had a couple of main goals for e-science. Um, one was to provide conceptual context for data interpretation. So they might have had lots of different um, scientific data that they needed to understand and correlate. Provenance would be um, a basis for data quality. So provenance is like where did this data come from? By whom? Who authored it? Where did, you know, what was its background? Because there's um, a lot of trust issues. So with scientific data, you have to reference you know, who did it and when did it happen. And um, I, I'm sure there are a lot of actual probably laws that define with, that deal with um, executing you know, tests in laboratories for you know, drug making and things like that. I'm sure, I'm not sure. And then interoperability and integration because uh, lots of different scientific fields have lots of different types of data, but all maybe share similar scientific pro pro processes. Um, they talk about a couple of types of pro provenance system provenance being who, when, where, how. how um, if you think about somebody doing. Um, some drug study or some laboratory experiment, you know, who was it on what day, what did they work on, um, what were they solving, um, if they, um, a couple other bullet points there talk about their workflow processes and their inputs and output data. Um, so basically it's a way that as they're producing data, they're semantically annotating it as, um, you know, they might have used, say, a blood sample for some test. So they got to document the sample, they've got to document the test, the process, what their work was, and what was the result and the data that they produced. So they, they're annotating all that. <coughs> and that is the provenance of that piece of the system. Semantic proven provenance seems to apply more to a higher level, more generic level, where um, 
you're trying to go across several domains, perhaps data and process and equipment to, to extract um, interesting meanings. So um, system provenance might be more like um, querying to say um, what was the specific piece of data that went into that ex specific um, experiment or something very system specific, whereas the, the other might be more broad to, to say might be something where you were trying to correlate a piece of data for different data samples that might have gone to different laboratories and different locations around the country that all derive, uh, were used to derive some result. And the question, you know, maybe the result was something serious or bad like Ebola or something and they're trying to figure out and trace through the system where did that come from. Or, Maybe it's a bad example, but um, the e-science case study. There were several dimensions. We talked about semantic provenance and uh, the domain provenance. They had ontologies there. The so it, this is pretty much just a recap of the last one. Usage is more of actually trying to uh, extract meaning and um, be able to visualize the meaning once they have all that data um, in place. Um, then the, the chapter kind of sums up with a bunch of examples of references to real world examples or uh, projects that were examined. Um, but the, the key overview is that there were a couple of ways of classifying semantic applications. Um, in the discussion of a semantic application, if you wanted to um, talk about this one versus that one. So there were a couple of high-level ways, um, including do they support semantic search and contextual browsing or not, and to what extent. Um, semantic integration would be um, and knowledge discovery would obviously have to do with how much of the, um, basically like the automation are they doing to be able to extract actionable intelligence. So it's one thing to mark up your data, it's one thing to search the data, um, but are you able to extract some sort of, you know, business intelligence out of that? That's, that would be the third category. So integration would have to come before that, right? You want to aggregate all your information before you do your analytics. That makes sense. That yeah, that makes sense. And then there were observations discussed about ontologies, um, and I believe that's in reference to you know there's a lot of examples, a lot of different systems out there, um, and so when you want to speak to um, what is the difference of one system to another, and there were several things outlined here with respect to their ontologies that they, that they encountered. Um, one was uh, depth and expressiveness, so how complete or incomplete is it? Um, they, used, they used ontology to reference like knowledge base a lot in this section, so they're talking about constraint violations and things, they're actually talking about um, all of the facts in the, in the knowledge base, so, so if a system exists out there with all of this, did they actually have bad data, good data, things like that. Um, then I guess the, the depth of an ontology, we, I think we've talked about this before as well. You have a problem with expressiveness versus computational complexity. You know, how deep does this, this tree go and how much do you annotate every single entity? Um, the scope of the ontology, this was this refers to, did somebody write an ontology that basically just says, this is an event, it was really generic, or did they say, here's something very specific to our business, this event is a business event, and it has these properties, things like that. Um, 
domain variance between competitors. I think that goes to, that just speaks to the point of, um, you, if you found um, enterprises that had ontologies for their data and they competed in the same markets, the question then, you know, the scope of the ontology to, to is, could be used to do, um, to compare the two to say, um, perhaps this company uses a very generic ontology and maybe that's extremely useful for whatever um, application it's supporting. Size and knowledge extraction. Ontology size meaning not just how big the ontology is, but also the, the set of facts you have. So some systems out there might have all this in place and they have a very small population of facts. Um, freshness refers to um, what we've talked about with the, um, the score and the other systems that we've talked about where they're extracting data and scraping and, and pulling that daily or on some basis, so that's the freshness. Um, and depth versus scale, well, yeah, that, we kind of covered that as well. So scalability is an issue as soon as you start to get lots of, of facts. And semantic operations refers to, you know, does a, does a business do, the, do all the things we've talked about? Do they um, automatically extract data? Do they update their ontologies? Do they provide search? Do they um, provide the, uh, do, do they provide a way to get actionable intelligence? And basically the issues there are scalability, obviously, so maybe somebody could implement um, a simple demonstration of the capability but doesn't scale to the enterprise size. And then the last bullet point there, name identity recognition and semantic ambiguity, we talked about that in the last class, actually, in the last class's lecture. And I think that's it. So, not a whole lot new there. More of like an application of semantics. So is there any questions? say, what is cloud computing? Um, cloud computing, according to the dictionary, is the practice of using a network of remote servers on the internet to store, manage, or process data, as opposed to local, local servers or uh, desktop computers. Um, that term is the dictionary definition but it's also being thrown around now as a buzzword. You'll hear multiple people talking about uh, join the cloud and all this um, advertisement that's going on. But most of that talk is just superfluous. It has no real uh, impact onto or identification of what the cloud actually is. Um, first, I like to say, um, the cloud is the base of all of your networking, uh, not networking, uh, programming uh, projects that from now on. should be the base of all your programming projects from now on. It allows you to give a um, real-world aspect to your project in that it's both expandable, contractible, um, and uh, flexible in terms of both the cost, the resources used, and the location. So, for instance, most computers now are, I mean most servers now, are physical machines that you have to um, pay for in advance set them up, and once you pay for them, you own them for life, basically, which is about four years in today's technology. Um, with the cloud, it changes that in turn, and so that you 
no longer have to dedicate resources to infrastructure. And you can now use that um, to both uh, expand uh, horizontally and vertically as been described before. So there, you can integrate between multiple uh, players and both scale up and down in your resource usage. So as I said, cloud computing is considered to be the base of semantics. So you'll see here, um, this image what, uh, provided by Dr. Shep um, is, shows how all of the different technologies for semantics all build on top of cloud computing. Um, and there's actually, you can actually do a tie back from your services to cloud computing itself. This is the APIs that you would, that you can use to both to allow your application to control its own resource usage. Um, I'd like to now talk about the different cloud computing paradigms that there are. Um, there are a scale that you can be they can use. Um, as shown by the image from Dr. Shep in his uh, project, that um, shows how much um, or how little uh, infrastructure is provided by, not infrastructure, um, yeah, um, add-ons are provided by your provider, such that you have from uh, most uh, provided to least provided, but also least flexible to most flexible. So you have what's known as SaaS or software as a service. You may have heard this before. This is akin to your email clients, your web browsers, um, anything that you go on the web and access, and they they provide you with the software. Uh, then you go down and level and you have platforms as a service. Platforms as a service can be uh, like databases, uh, web servers. Uh, these are one step away from hardware, but you still are not in control of the hardware. It, it allows you to um, not have to worry about that in terms of use. And then you can go one step lower, which is called infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service is you're given uh, virtual hardware that acts and behaves as physical hardware should. And therefore, you have full control over that virtual hardware in terms of its use and applications. So this shows that there's a uh, variable range between how flexible it is to how powerful uh, this is considered to be like the most flexible in terms of what you can do with it, but it comes with the least amount of pre-built packages in terms of uh, what you can, what is provided for you. So now I'd like to talk about the roles of semantics in cloud computing. The first role of semantics in cloud computing is the uh, type of semantics that you can use. Um, the type of semantics allows for multiple things, including portability and interrupt, and interrupt, uh, interrupt operability. Sorry about that. Um, This uh, role of semantics allows you to overcome the issue that plagues most cloud computing platforms as of right now. Um, the major problem that it overcomes is that there are multiple different providers and they all have their own method of doing things, um, such that if you're going to create a new VM, virtual machine, um, each, each 
player in the market has their own uh, way of doing this. And this is one of the uh, things that semantics can overcome by allowing you to write, write once, use everywhere. That's the major thing of semantics. Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about uh, in terms of roles of semantics that you can use in cloud computing is the level of abstraction. This allows you to um, give granularity and specificity to your applications in terms of what its hardware uses are being. Uh, take into, let's just give the example of you have yourself a database server. And on that database server, you have mm, maybe, let, let's, go, let's go generous, let's say 100 gigabytes of RAM on that server. And you see, you'll say, I'll never end up using all of this for um, your application. But one day you get hit by a denial of service attack or other sort of uh, hacking tool. And then that boosts your uh, amount of resources you need to use way out of what you were expecting. Well, with abstraction, you can actually allow your application to uh, expand and overcome these hurdles that um, can play standard technologies. Um, and lastly, um, semantics can help in the software life cycle uh, to help overcome the issues plagued by um, Issues that can be uh, not all that. the issues of not being able to define all of the <coughs> problems that can occur in that. Um, it gives uh, a basis for what issues can arise and um, in the development cycle. So most times when you're developing an application, you'll spend a bunch of time planning, but you still run into problems in the development portion of it. Semantics can help arise, yeah, to leave that um, issue. So next I'd like to talk about um, the different types of semantics in cloud computing. They are system semantics, data semantics, non-functional semantics, and logic or process semantics. System semantics uh, deal with physical resources, such as um, characteristics and uh, deployment and load balancing. Uh, this is probably the major portion of what you think of when you think of cloud computing, in terms of it allows you to abstract out uh, different levels onto your application. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about uh, data semantics. Data semantics pertain to the data itself, how um, your data can be arranged, uh, what technologies you need for your data. Um, Non-functional semantics are akin to business rules. Um, I know. They're like quality of service and business rules, yes. Um, it pertains to like how something should be run, like uh, whether or not this person gets uh, at X amount of money or so and so forth. And not money, but like resource allocation. Not resource allocation, but um, quality of service. Um, and last, you have logic and process semantics. Pertains to the core function of your applications, and such as um, runtime and like, other issues like that. <coughs> Uh, a 
I'd now like to talk about different cloud semantic uh, formats and you know, their work groups. Uh, the different, there's uh, three different cloud semantic uh, work groups. There is the cloud management, the cloud uh, audit, uh, audition data federation, the cloud entitlement work group, and there are those are the three different work groups in charge of diff the different cloud standards. And there's also the uh, open virtualization standard uh, to use for semantics. Uh, I'm now going to show you uh, cloud management work group. This is their website. It deals with um, the setup, uh, specifications, and uh, int uh, management of cloud resources. Um, this is the site for the auditing uh, federation. So this is what the um, resource usage look like, so auditing techniques for cloud uh, site, uh, platforms, the software entitlement work group, and the open virtualization format. So the open virtualization format is an open standard format for cloud usage. It allows you to set up and use uh, cloud-based platforms in an open standard semantic way. said, there is still a large amount of portions of the software APIs that have yet to be explored. Um, it's still a growing field, and there are um, not, since it's such a vast uh, platform, and it's the base of most technologies, there are still a vast number of things that need to be done in order to get the semantics up and running. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Chet for this image as well. Uh, now I'd like to talk about some different uh, cloud platforms that are available. Um, these are some of the standard names you'll hear when you're thinking um, uh, in terms of cloud uh, APIs. So I'd first like to talk about OpenStack. It's a open standard virtualization uh, platform similar to uh, the Amazon EC2. It uh, allows you to specify uh, virtual machines for any hardware usage that you can have, as well as providing uh, virtual networking technologies to, to um, add a, uh, accommodate um, next, I want to talk about Amazon uh, EC2. Amazon EC2 is a um, cloud platform that uh, allows for virtualization and pay-as-you-go sort of technology. So you only pay for the hardware when you're using it. Um, v, uh, VMware is another open, is not an open, it's another uh, uh, technology, it's considered a major company uh, to install virtualization on your own hardware. Uh, Rackspace is a competitor to Amazon, it's, they provide um, uh, cloud platforms in terms of infrastructure. So these, these are all infrastructure level soft, uh, in, in Infrastructure level services, so IIAAS, um, and then you have a Google platform. Uh, it's a programming platform, so you can create um, uh, your own uh, applications to run on the Google platform. 
and it's con it's considered like a platform as a service. So you can use it instead of hosting your own hardware. Um, so this is an example of EC2 instance creation. So all of these technologies have APIs available so that you can uh, create and manage your resources in your application lo layer. Um, so this just shows an example of how uh, you can create an, an instance, otherwise known as a virtual machine, um, with your uh, specific hardware requirements. Uh, it allows you to do this in your application, and therefore you can um, um, it allows the load balancing to no longer be uh, uh, abstracted from, I mean, it allows the load balance to be abstracted enough that you can put it in your application and have a scalable application. Um, so this is the Amazon EC2. Uh, I've gotten the code from, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Syrian friends from uh, on the Google code for this. And this is an uh, OpenStack um, implementation. You'll see here that this is this is regular, um, I guess, JSON, I think. Missing the code traces, but. Um, this, this shows how you can create an instance in uh, OpenStack, which may be useful for um, future references, for future reference um, in terms of the OpenStack cluster that you're going to have here. Um, you'll see that this is just key pair names and standard uh, technology. Uh, this is an empty document, so you'll see that it doesn't really mean anything, but uh, it just shows the uh, flavor of how this will work. Um, uh, then I'd like to uh, give reference to these people for their uh, uh, content that I've now presented. And I'd now like to show um, a bit of what I mean by uh, terms of usage. So you may or may not have seen this already. If you have, that is uh, good. Uh, and bear with me, this may break because it's been, um, I've been dealing with issues with where it uh, will like to become unstable. Um, itself deals mostly with uh, providing abstraction for hardware and hardware usage. So with OpenStack, I can uh, allow, there, there's some as a stack, and I can um, give a small little excerpt of uh, code to have it create uh, virtual machines in a uh, REST API manner. So all of this is a REST API and therefore can be called by any application that you're making to um, uh, set up what um, hardware you'd need at an application layer. So, so this is the uh, OpenStack documents in a simple uh, heat template. So heat is the technology that OpenStack uses for um, 
orchestration, otherwise known as set, um, the REST API for uh, OpenStack. And this may not work because I still have to um, set up some networking things, but it sh will sh just show you an example of how um, different things can work, I mean, different um, setup can be used for uh, orchestration. Uh, so yes, I think I already have my orchestration. Maybe. So I, I have just gotten this up today for testing, um, see if it works or anything. Um, so you'll see it's just a, stand, it's just a uh, simple It didn't work. <clears throat> so, okay, yeah. So this one, it failed because I have multiple networks on there and it doesn't know where to put it. So, but I'll just show you what this looks like anyway. So you'll see, it just has a, if this had worked, which it will if I had uh, put the correct syntax in there, um, it would show what your technology will look like in terms of a cloud. Uh, it would give a uh, graph representation of the cloud um, setup. So this one, I was just creating a simple VM, and you'll see that it just shows the little VM machine there. And the different uh, resources that could have been used in events that have happened. Um, So overall, I like to mention that cloud computing, in and of itself, can be a misnomer uh, from what you'll see on uh, most advertisements. Most advertisements give the um, whole industry term just as a buzzword, but there is still a valid reasoning to delve into cloud computing as a viable technology for future uh, for, for future applications. <coughs> and hopefully you can do this in a semantic way to uh, provide integration through ontologies and other manners um, to better describe what's going on. <coughs> 